income and tell it to us. Uh, we've added a cap to the tax. The cap is uh, meaning a maximum rate past which an individual does not pay. And it is capped to the greater of $2,200 and adjusted for inflation or twice the previous year's permanent fund dividend, again, whichever is greater. Simple arithmetic, uh, at a little bit over $147,000, 1.5% tax equals to exactly $2,200. So at lower income levels, it's simply a 1.5% tax. At, at higher incomes, it would be the capped tax. And that cap will impact just about 5% of earners. The, the fifth percentile for an individual in Alaska is about $147,000 for a household hire. Uh, so the foregone revenue, the money we're not getting because of this cap, is in the neighborhood of 10 to $20 million. So our $320 million bill, if the cap were to be removed and the same basic structure maintained, would become a $330 or $340 million revenue bill. Seeing no questions, uh, the rest of the... I'm sorry, Mr. Alper, I've got a question from Representative uh, Kira. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Alper, obviously, I mean, you know some of the concerns I have about this that, that tilt this sort of towards a higher tax rate for middle and lower income people as opposed to wealthier people who have a lower tax rate, which uh, that's still a, a problem that I see. But the other one, I, and I would ask you about, is not taxing investment income. So we've, you know, we, we've seen... Warren Buffett statements that since he makes his money off of investments, he pays a lower tax rate than a secretary. Um, here, uh, you're not taxing investment income, so that's that's usually much wealthier people. They uh, get dividends, they get capital gains, and um, that seems like a second place where wealthier people are treating being treated better than middle and lower income people. What's what's the reason for that? So through the chair, Representative Guerra, uh, when Warren Buffett is speaking, he, the, the federal income tax rate on capital gains is lower than the income tax rate on, on general income. And that's his observation that he's paying at a lower rate than, than his secretary. So in our, my previous presentation two weeks ago, I talked about some of our thinking behind the cap. Uh, it's a way of distinguishing this from a true income tax uh, that we're not uh, the person who is very highly productive and earns a lot of money uh, isn't in any way penalized for his additional income. This was sort of part of the pushback from, frankly, the other body, who were very uh, strongly against an income tax. So this structure, although based on wages, uh, falls short of being a true income tax in many ways because of, of that cap. Uh, you are correct that the by eliminating capital gains and similar uh, non-earned income, unearned income, it tends to make the tax lower on the higher income individuals. Uh, there's a slide coming up in a few that, that I, that's a rerun from my last presentation that shows the effective tax rates on different income levels based on this bill. A similar analysis of a true income tax is much more progressive. You see a higher take at higher rates, largely because of that capital gains uh, involvement where you have the uh, where the, more of their income falls under the falls under the tax, uh, this income tax structure is more flat. That one and a half percent holds pretty much across the board, and then you see the effective rates falling at the very high levels, in part due to the portion of their income that's not taxed because it's capital gains, and in part because of the cap itself. That's correct. Representative Gere. Thank you, and, and I, I understand why you're doing this. You're trying to bring um, those with a different philosophy um, uh, in the Senate on board. You've, uh, the commissioner was pretty clear about that. Um, uh, um, but, and so I'm not, sh I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wait to see where we can get. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to sort of shoot anything out of the air. Um, but so Warren Buffett under federal law would pay a, a lower tax rate. Here, Warren Buffett would pay no tax rate um, uh, uh, if he doesn't get taxed on his in investments. And, and I guess I, 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 I know you didn't mean what you said. I think you were probably trying to attribute this as a statement to other people who believe that. But this idea that wealthier people are more productive, uh, um, I, I know you don't believe that. Um, I know that uh, you know somebody who's a nurse, somebody who is a laborer, is just as a productive member of society as somebody who makes a large amount of income. I think you're probably trying to transpose what you've heard from some other people. Uh, through the chair, Representative Garrett, thank you. And I, it, your 
putting me in sensitive ground here, but <laughs> yes, there, uh, there is a philosophy held by many that an income tax is, uh, is fundamentally wrong. There are certain people who's, who believe that, the taxing people for their, for their assets, for their productivity, for their wealth is, is wrong, and they, they might prefer to, if we have to tax, tax on consumption. It's a philosophical point. Uh, a, a full income tax, which is open-ended at the top, does take its highest amount from the people who earn the most. And uh, because it does not seem possible to pass such a tax, but because we strongly believe we need a viable revenue measure so as to ensure that we could operate a viable government for years to come, this was an attempt at a compromise of trying to bring people together. Just briefly, Mr. Representative Gura. And I, and I get that, uh, Mr. Alper, and I'm not pushing an income tax. I'm also trying to try and figure out something that we can get agreement on. Um, uh, so, but those are my concerns about, about some of the things so far. Representative Ortiz. Um, Ken, if you were to uh, lift the cap or if you were to begin to tax um, capital gains, would you also then have to tax um, retirees' incomes and pensions and those kinds of things, which this bill does not? Uh, through the Chair, Representative Ortiz, there's no have to. We, the bill can be written in any way. Uh, the, a, a capital gain standalone module on top of this, it could be built into the language of the bill, just capital gains, or for that matter, just interest, or just retirement, or just dividends. You know, dividends is important for Alaskans. The permanent fund dividend is not income under this bill, so it would not be taxed. So if we added dividends broadly, we would also be uh, bringing in the permanent fund dividend. Uh, I'm a little reluctant based upon the reaction I got from Representative Pruitt a couple of weeks ago to mention ITEP, the, uh, the, the analyst who does a lot of state level uh, analysis for all, all over the country and they did some work for this committee. They have a, a series of charts that shows the effective tax rates and of uh, the income tax, the sales tax, the, a head tax similar to this. And they also did an analysis of a head tax with a capital gains module added on top of it that uh, that was mildly progressive. It created a little bit of a bump at the higher income levels. I know that uh, that members of this committee have contemplated uh, structures like that. There, there's lots of different ways to skin the cat. Ultimately, uh, at the administration, although we might have our preferences, the, the bigger preference is that we get a fiscal solution done during this, this uh, special session, and we're not going to quibble too much on the details. Representative Ortiz and then Representative Wilson. And sorry if I missed this one, but if you were to make capital gains a part of this, do we have an estimate as to how much more revenue it might generate? Uh, through the Chair, Representative Ortiz, I don't off this top of my head. If we're assuming the same 1.5%, uh, it, it shouldn't be too hard. I, and I know we have it in the modeling. I just frankly don't know it off the top of my head. Just guessing, probably another $50 million or so. Uh, I might live to regret having said that in committee, but uh, that's... Uh, it, it, how that falls out in scale to the other income factors and that it's limited to a relatively small sub subset of the population, I'm guessing. Now, let me caveat that. That's without a cap. If there's still the cap, most of the people who live off capital gains would still be paying at the $2,200, and we might not see much additional revenue at all. Thank you. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what was the analysis of a single mother of three that we've already taken over $4,000 away because of the PFD cut, who has decided to work at a minimum um, paying job because they don't want to be on welfare. It is an income tax to them, is it not, if that is their only money that they have coming in? Through the Chair, Representative Wilson, it is a tax on her income. It does not necessarily meet the, the strict definition of an income tax because it's only taxing certain portions of income. In the case of the, the single mother you describe, it would absolutely be a tax on her income of, of one and a half percent. And uh, reasonable people disagree on how to characterize the reduction in the permanent fund dividend. Follow up? Follow up? Well, it's a loss to their income. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you can call it what you want, but they didn't get $2,200 in the mail. You know, it was, it was cut. So. I guess you can argue terminology, but there's still loss in how much money came into their household. But I guess what I'm trying, and, and kind of back to where Representative Garrett was going, the percentage of, it, 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 and it is an income tax in that scenario, because if that's their only income that they have coming in, same thing in a middle class family that 
you know, maybe you still, you don't have any other income put away, you know, you're not living off of anything, that's all that you have. So how does the department justify, or whoever, well, I'm assuming, or the governor, because he had the bill brought forward, the percentage of money that one's gonna pay into government by their own wages compared to someone who's making $100,000 who has been able to put money into IRAs, into other savings to live off of, it's gonna be such a smaller amount of loss to them. So I, I'm just trying to figure out why we would again hit the, the lower and middle class, the ones who are trying to get on their feet for whatever reason at such a higher level as far as how much they have coming in. So Representative Wilson, through the chair, I think it's important to, to go back to the pedigree of this bill and how it developed just quickly. And I, I talked about this some a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and congratulations on your grandchild, by the way. I know you weren't here a couple of weeks ago. The, uh, uh, so the genesis of this bill evolved from the, the school head tax bills. And the, the old school head tax that Alaska had in place from uh, territorial times through the late 70s was a, a flat rate of the first check earned, and it went towards the school system. And there have been a couple of different variants on that bill that have been brought forward in the last couple of years as a potential revenue measure. Uh, the mo uh, Representative Clayman had one that's in this committee. Represent uh, Senator Bishop had one in the other body. Uh, Senator Bishop's bill was used in many ways as the model for this. And the def definitions in those bills say wages and self-employment income, meaning it's, it's not an income tax, it's a payroll tax, and it's purpose-built to just try to scoop a little bit from... Uh, regular labor. Not try, it's a simpler bill. It's not as deep into the economy. It, it's not as complicated. So the way the Bishop bill was written had a series of stair steps. You make an income level, you pay 100. You make the next income level, you pay 200. I think his capped out at $500. The issue with the stair step is what happens at the transition where you end up with a very high marginal tax rate. So by turning it from a stair step to a flat percentage, the net effect is the same, only you don't have the weird transitions when someone steps from one bracket to another. And then the next decision is, well, how big are we going to make it? If we wanted to base it on, say, the Bishop bill, it might be more like a, a quarter to a half of 1%, because that bill would have raised $70 million. If we wanted it more like the Clayman bill, it would be more like, let's say, 3%, because that raised 500 and some million dollars. So we chose... Uh, $300 million as a revenue target and therefore used 1.5%. But the bones of this bill come from absolutely from the school head tax bills, not from the income tax bill. Follow up? Follow up? I honestly don't care where it came from, but I'm just trying to figure out what the philosophy, and maybe the commissioner would like to address it instead, um, why we would hit lower and middle class harder, which is going to, because you, you have to put the PFD cut into this because that affected how much money goes into their households. So I, I understand trying to do a flat rate because it's easier to do, but, but we're talking about teenagers who will pay when those who are able to live off of others will pay nothing. We're talking about the, the ones who are trying to get off of you know, welfare and, and has to start at a low income are gonna get hit harder. So I'm just, you know, I understand the flat rate, I understand the other bills they have, but there had to have been something in the modeling that said that you were okay, not you personally, the administration was okay of hitting, again, harder, the lower and middle class incomes. I mean, and I'm just trying to figure out where that philosophy came from. So through the chair, uh, Representative Wilson, this bill is more or less viewed in a vacuum and not as combined with changes to the permanent fund. In that vacuum, as a standalone bill, it truly is a flat tax. 